Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday show in which we cover all news relating to spaceflight, spaceships, and all the best space anniversaries for the next seven days. And this week we'll be flying all over the world from the shores of Japan to the deserts of West Texas. Before we jump into our first segment, though, if you want YouTube to sometimes, but not always guarantee, notifying you of these videos, then do make sure you click that subscribe button down below. But, you know, enough of this intro gaff. Let's jump right into our first segment of the show, all the news from last week. Our first launch from last week was China's Long March 4B launch, which sent the Haiyang 2C Ocean Observation Satellite into orbit on the 21st of September. This will form part of the Haiyang 2 satellite system, which will use ocean color remote sensing satellites, ocean dynamic environmental satellites, and ocean surveillance satellites to monitor ocean pollution and ocean topography, you know, things like wave height and stuff. China are becoming increasingly more concerned about the dangers of falling rocket stages near populated areas since you know, this probably isn't a good thing to be crashing near schools and because of this the first stage was fitted with grid fins to help direct its impact location to somewhere safe. And that's it, actually. There were plans to launch a Delta IV, Falcon 9, and New Shepard, but unfortunately these launches have all been pushed back. But we can still talk about those in our next week segment, so don't click off just yet. Before we can do that, though, we can talk about some Starship news. Yes, we finally saw the SN7.1 explode on the 23rd of September. SpaceX sadly didn't release an official video, and all the people who film this stuff hold copyrights, and none of them reply to my emails or DMs. So I'm going to have to rely on our state-of-the-art simulation for on-screen b-roll for this bit. Anyway, uh, SpaceX deliberately pressurized SN7.1 to bursting point so that they could learn more about the limits of the Starship's structure, which will help ensure that the real thing is as safe as possible. It was tested on several September nights and was finally pushed to a failure point on the 23rd. The SN7.1 tank failed at a pressure of 8 bar, higher than the SN7, which only managed to reach 7.6 bar before leaks started appearing. In other Starship news, on the 23rd of September, the SN8 had two aft fins installed, and it went on to complete a flap actuation test. Exciting stuff. On the 24th, we spied a header tank for the fabled SN11, and on the same day, we watched SpaceX complete a full duration test fire of the Raptor vacuum engine for Starship. This thing is absolutely gigantic compared to its lower atmosphere brother, and you can thank air pressure for that. For best efficiency, the the air pressure at the nozzle exit needs to match the ambient air pressure. For sea level, this means that the engine bell doesn't have to be that big since the exhaust needs to be at a pressure of one atmosphere. A vacuum engine, though, needs to somehow reduce its exhaust to zero atmosphere, which is impossible since that would require an infinitely large nozzle, but you can get pretty close to zero if you use a big enough engine bell, which this new Raptor seems to have. Anyway, that's everything spaceflight that happened last week. Lots to look forward to in our next segment, but before we get to that, if you are enjoying this video, then leave a like down below to help out the channel. Remember, one like equals one prayer for the SLS actually launching one day. But I guess no matter how many likes this video gets, it probably won't be enough for an SLS launch next week, but I do know of a few rockets that might. <laughs> Our first space flight this week is the hopeful launch of a Russian Soyuz rocket, which will carry three Gonet M satellites from the Plesetska Cosmodrome into orbit on the 28th of September. These communication satellites are an upgraded version of the tired old existing Gonet satellites, and they're designed to monitor ecological and industrial objects, as well as provide communication and data transmission services. The satellites' reach can extend all the way into remote areas, so it can provide vital services for people working in isolated far north regions. The Soyuz rocket itself will be the 2.1B variant, which is a three-stage carrier rocket capable of placing payloads of up to 8,200 kilograms into low Earth orbit. This mission is a very important one, especially for all the good folks working in remote regions, so I really do hope that this mission succeeds without a hitch. 
Also on September the 28th, we should be seeing a Falcon 9 launch Starlink 12 from the Kennedy Space Center, which will be the 13th batch of approximately 60 satellites that will join SpaceX's Starlink Mega Constellation, which, when completed, will provide high-speed internet access on a global level. This launch has suffered from a couple of delays, but all signs are looking positive for a successful liftoff on Monday. And who doesn't love a good Falcon 9 launch to kick the week off? Our next launch is a biggie, or should I say heavy? Yes, it's the Enrol 44 Delta IV Heavy launch, which has had a few delays over these past weeks, with its most recent setback being related to the hydraulic system that retracts its swing arm. The rocket and its classified payload for the National Reconnaissance Office remain in good condition, so hopes are high for a launch very soon. United Launch Alliance are currently aiming to launch this mammoth rocket no earlier than Tuesday the 29th, but we should hopefully get to see it soar skyward before the end of the week. This will be the 141st mission for United Launch Alliance and the 12th Delta IV Heavy flight. My favourite thing about this mission though is the fact that it has a dog on the mission banner. Oh, isn't that nice? Our next launch will be another Falcon 9 rocket carrying the US Air Force's fourth third generation navigation satellite into orbit for the Global Positioning System. This third generation navigation satellite is built by Lockheed Martin and it will provide accurate map data once it reaches Earth orbit. This launch has been delayed from October, December, May, July and August, so uh, hopefully September will be the lucky sixth time's a charm. The current anticipated launch date is September the 30th, so keep your eyes peeled to the sky. And then to the ground when the booster lands again, I guess. I don't know. Moving along, on the same day we have the launch of the Northrop Grumman's Antares rocket, which will be flying the NG-14 resupply mission to the International Space Station. The payload is a Cygnus cargo freighter, which will carry lots of important stuff to the astronauts aboard the space station. This will be the 15th Cygnus mission, and it'll remain docked to the ISS for about a month before leaving and re-entering the atmosphere in November. Across the Pacific in Taikicho, Japan, we may see the launch of Interstellar Technologies' Momo Rocket Flight 7 mission, whose launch window for this flight opens on the 30th of September. While there's no official confirmation that this will be the day the rocket flies, through the power of friendship and hope, I am optimistic that we should get to see this thing launch by the end of this week at the very least. The Momo is a sounding rocket capable of delivering a 20 kilogram payload to a 100 kilometer height, right at the edge of space. As a sounding rocket, it's not an orbital class booster. Instead, it just sort of hurls its payload on a suborbital trajectory. But it's a vital first step for the young Interstellar Technologies company on their quest to construct their Zero rocket, which will be a rocket capable of launching small sats into orbit for a much lower cost than what's currently available. And they hope to get it built and into the skies by 2022. Last week, we unfortunately didn't get to watch Blue Origin launch their new Shepard mission NS-13 after the vehicle suffered from a few technical issues. However, rumours are now flying in that we may see this mission take flight as soon as September 30th, or if not, then very soon regardless. This will be Blue Origin's 13th New Shepard mission and the seventh consecutive flight for this particular booster, a record for Blue Origin, to demonstrate the vehicle's operational reusability. It's not all for show though, the mission will also be carrying various scientific payloads, including a microgravity lily pond, an autonomous plant growth system for use in microgravity, and some equipment from NASA designed to cool electronics in power dense spacecraft. The New Shepard is certainly much cooler than a more traditional sounding rocket, so here's hoping that we'll get to see this launch go ahead. To wrap this section up, we have another Starlink launch planned for this week. Yes, the mad lads at SpaceX plan to launch Starlink 13 aboard a Falcon 9 rocket on Thursday, October the 1st, just one or two days after Starlink 12. I can't get enough of Falcon 9 launches, so getting two in one week is always good news. But now it's time to move along to our next segment of the show, which is covering all of the best historical spaceflight anniversaries that are going to take place over the next seven days. We begin our history segment on the 28th of September in the ancient era of 2008, 
when the then up-and-coming space agency SpaceX launched the fourth flight of their Falcon 1 rocket. The previous three flights of the two-stage rocket had not been successful and this fourth flight really was a make-or-break moment for SpaceX. Luckily, on its fateful fourth flight, Falcon flew fantastically and became the first privately developed liquid fuel ground-launched vehicle to place a payload in Earth orbit. The rocket went on to have a prosperous career, launching a staggering once more ever. Yes, immediately after proving the validity of the rocket, SpaceX abandoned the Falcon 1 in favour of furthering development of their Falcon 9, with the only commercial contract of the Falcon 1 being the placement of a Malaysian satellite into low Earth orbit. The most comparable rockets to the Falcon 1 these days are probably Rocket Lab's Electron and Astra's, uh rocket, though the latter is yet to prove its orbital capability. Our next anniversary is on the 29th of September, this time in 1988 when NASA launched STS-26, the first shuttle mission since the loss of Space Shuttle Challenger, which had occurred three years prior. This was the seventh flight of Space Shuttle Discovery and was the first time an all-veteran crew had flown in a NASA vehicle since Apollo 11. The shuttle was launched using the newly designed solid rocket boosters, a flaw in the old design being the cause of the Challenger's destruction. Whilst the mission went well and the crew returned to Earth safely, post-flight analysis found that Discovery had suffered severe damage to its underwing thermal protection tiles. A 12-inch long piece of cork insulation had separated from the forward field joint of one of its solid rocket boosters and struck the shuttle. The damage was so significant that the thermal protection tile almost completely eroded during re-entry. It was a similar chain of events that ultimately led to the loss of Space Shuttle Columbia 15 years later. I think it's a fair assumption that if Discovery had met this fate on this first post-Challenger flight, then the shuttle fleet would probably have never flown again. A few days later, we have another Space Shuttle anniversary. On the 3rd of October in 1985, the Space Shuttle Atlantis made its first flight. This was the fourth operational and second to last Space Shuttle to be constructed and was named after RV Atlantis, a two-masted sailing ship that served as the primary research vessel for the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution between 1930 and 1966. The shuttle would end up netting a few records during its 33 missions, including having the shortest time spent between two missions, conducting STS-61B and STS-51J only 50 days apart. Part. Atlantis also became the first shuttle to deploy an interplanetary probe when it released the Magellan spacecraft to Venus. Other notable achievements held by Atlantis include the 100th US crewed spaceflight, the first US shuttle Russian space station Mir docking and joint on-orbit operations, and the first on-orbit changeout of shuttle crew. Atlantis played a key role in the construction of the International Space Station, delivering several beefy components to the construction. One quirk of the vehicle was its reputation among the shuttle workforce for being more prone to problems needing addressing during launch preparations compared to the other shuttles in the fleet, uh, leading to some giving it the nickname Britney after Britney Spears. <laughs> Atlantis flew its 33rd and final mission in July 2011, and it's now enjoying its retirement on display at the Kennedy Space Center for all to admire. On the 4th of October in 1957, history is made in the Soviet Union. Sputnik 1 became the first artificial satellite to orbit Earth, cruising around the planet for three weeks before its batteries died, after which it continued to orbit in silence for a further two months before falling back to Earth. The unexpected success of Sputnik ended up sparking the Sputnik Crisis among Western nations, triggering the beginning of the space race between the US and Soviet Union and the creation of NASA. Sputnik wasn't just a dumb hunk of metal though. Tracking and studying it from Earth provided useful information to scientists. The density of the upper atmosphere could be deduced from its drag on Sputnik's orbit and the propagation of its radio signals provided data about the ionosphere. Perhaps the most significant benefit of Sputnik was the sheer show of strength it demonstrated for the Soviet Union. Not only was it a showcase of their technological prowess, but also a showcase of the distance capabilities of the Soviet missiles, given that Sputnik was launched using Soviet missile technology. 
And thus began one of the greatest competitions mankind has ever held. I am certain all of the incredible technological leaps that came about during the space race need no introduction among this video's audience, but it's important to remember the plucky little Sputnik that ignited it all. Cheers to you, my little metal comrade. Our final historical anniversary this week takes place on October the 4th, 2004, when Spaceship One won the Ansari X Prize for private spaceflight, taking home the 10 million US dollar prize money after its creator, Scaled Composites, became the first non-government organization to launch a reusable crewed spacecraft into space twice within a fortnight. Unlike space planes such as the Buran and Space Shuttle, the Spaceship One doesn't have the ability to reach orbit. Doing so requires several orders of magnitude more thrust and fuel. Instead, it accelerates rapidly onto a ballistic trajectory that arcs it above the Kármán line for a brief amount of time before descending back down into the atmosphere. It has been likened to the X-15 space plane, which similarly launched from the wing of a carrier aircraft and accelerated onto a ballistic trajectory that would take it just beyond the atmosphere momentarily. After the Spaceship One made its historic flight, it was retired immediately. <laughs> but it did spur a partnership between Scaled Composites and the Virgin Group to create the bigger and better Spaceship Two, a commercial space plane to take paying customers into space and with the successful space flight of the VSS Unity in late 2018 under their belts, we'll hopefully start seeing this thing make regular commercial flights sooner rather than later. But that about wraps it up for all the cool historic spaceflight anniversaries that we've got to look forward to over the next seven days. So let me think about it. We've done last week's news, we've done this week's news, and we've covered all the coolest historical spaceflight anniversaries. That can only mean one thing. It is time once again to call this episode a wrap and thus bring this week's Space This Week to an end. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I do hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to see more like it, there is a link to the full Space This Week playlist on the left-hand side of the screen. And on the right-hand side, you can find a link to a video that was chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation system based on your viewing habits. I think I've said my piece and I don't need to waffle on too much longer. So guys, thank you for watching once again and have an excellent week.